thank you um, very much for that really kind introduction. And you're right, that meeting in Madrid was really interesting and um, stimulating, but I'm also extremely excited to be here at the Developing Mind series. I think it's a wonderful lecture series um, promoting a really important topic, telling us some very exciting things. So I hope that I can um, contribute to that. Um, my talk is about 45 to 50 minutes. I'm happy to, if you have um, sort of clarify question, open questions or questions you wanted to put in the chat, I can monitor the chat, so I'm happy to do that. Um, similarly, I have a, sorry, a Southern English accent, which can sometimes go a bit fast. So please uh, stop me if you want me with, again, with a little message in the chat, if you want me to re repeat anything or say anything again. Um, so today I'm going to talk about an issue that has been worrying me for, well, not worrying me, but interesting me, me, an interesting issue I thought about for many years, which is this question, and why do children differ in how quickly they learn language? And this is a, an important intellectual question, um, but it's also um, a really important societal question because it's quite well established that the children who enter school with poor language skills are much more likely to struggle in school. So, for example, they're much more likely to have difficulty learning to read or to write or to, in generally to perform less well. So it's quite an important issue to understand. And my goal in this talk is to introduce how we've been testing a constructivist approach, which is apt since it was the Jean Piaget Society where we met, Justin. Um, I'm going to sort of look at how we're testing a constructivist approach to explaining individual variation using the language zero to five project data that you mentioned in your introduction and some computer modeling work that I've been doing with Gary Jones, focusing on two particular tasks, uh, speed of lexical processing and non-word repetition performance, and the role that these things play in explaining individual differences. And to give away the punchline, uh, what I'm going to conclude is that to explain individual differences, you have to consider not only the child's language experience, but also the nature of the learning processing mechanisms they use to access the input Leona. and the amount of linguistic knowledge that the children have already acquired at the time of learning. So if you want to fall asleep for the next 45 minutes, that's the punchline. Um, but if you're interested, let's, um, let's look a little bit further. Let's start with the question that we want to address. The question is, why are there such huge individual differences in language acquisition trajectory in the first few years of life? And the differences really are huge. What you can see in this graph is the productive vocabulary differences across children from 16 to 18 to 30 months of age. So on the y-axis is the child children's productive vocabulary size. On the x-axis is the children's age in month from 16 to 30 months. Each dot on this is a child, so the, the vocabulary of each child. And what you can see in the different colors is the sort of percentile split, so where each child falls in the population. And differences emerge early and they grow across time. Um, there's a ceiling effect uh, later on where some of the children, uh, the faster children hit the ceiling on this 700 word checklist that they fill in, um, of, that their parents fill in. Um, but you can still see there's sort of still massive variation. So at 30 months, the fastest the children, the parents are ticking off nearly 700 words on this vocabulary checklist. So they're saying that their children can produce um, 700 words. Whereas the um, slowest children are really only producing, you know, sort of 10 or 20 words themselves at the same age. So most work on individual differences focuses on the role of the input. And the role of the input in interaction in particular does explain a substantial proportion of the variance. So a meta-analysis by Anderson et al. in 2021 reported an R of about 0.33 for input quality, which is things like the number of different words that the children hear or the syntactic diversity of their input. And an R of um, 20, 0.20, sorry, for input quantity, which is the number of words or number of utterances that a child hears. So the quality and the quantity of a child's input does make a substantial contribution to the development of their vocabulary and partially explains why um, some children are so much faster than others, but it doesn't explain hard, anything, everything, of course. It definitely doesn't explain why children are so different. 
And of course, that makes sense because children are input output machines. A whole load of different areas in the brain have to work together to uh, process and understand language. So what I'm showing here is just an example of um, from Hock, um, Hock and Popple of a theory of the uh, different areas of the, of the brain involved in processing language that sort of have to learn the areas that will be involved, th that will have to learn how to use language. And all of these areas interacting together are obviously going to play a role in how quickly children learn language. So, for example, the development of the articulatory network, which you can see up here on the top left, will determine partly how easily children map words onto their meaning or the development of the combinatorial network down uh, bottom left will uh, determine how easily children learn to put words together into sentences exactly for example. So what this means is that the process of language learning um, actually looks uh, something like this, that in order to explain individual differences, explain language acquisition, but actually explain individual differences, we need to consider not only the role of the input, but also the role of uh, the differences across children in the development of the constraints on learning and processing within this language system in the brain. And actually also differences in the child's current knowledge state, because the knowledge that you already have in your head will actually um, have an effect on um, new learning. So, for example, the more words you know, the faster you're going to be able to start developing syntactic knowledge. Um, and actually vice versa as well, that we know that the more grammatical knowledge you have, the easier it is that you find to identify the referent of novel words, etc. So all the different sort of the current knowledge state of your uh, language system will actually also have an impact on new learning. So if, if this is a sort of toy conceptualization, I guess, of a very sort of rough back of the envelope conceptualization of the language acquisition process. And we've been using this process, um, this sort of model over the last few years to explore what factors interact to cause individual differences. Um, and we've been doing this by uh, analyzing the data from the Language 0 to 5 project. Now, in this project, we followed um, British English learning children um, from monolingual homes and we recruited them when they were six months of age and we followed them all the way until they were four and a half years of age. And over those sort of four years, we took a range of measures of language, cognitive, sociocognitive um, development and also some motor skills. About 90 children completed at least one data point um, during this time. And you'll note that we, focused on children with no medical history and from mid to high SES, um, uh, socioeconomic status. And this is because we wanted to study what causes individual differences in children in the absence of clinical issues or in the absence of potential environmental deprivation, which we can talk about later if we want. But I think the important point is that we still do see a lot of individual variation in language development and vocabulary development in particular within this relatively homogeneous sample. So we still have enough individual differences to explain. And we've been using these data to, or this data set to explore a range of factors from the literature that have been suggested to affect or cause individual differences in language acquisition rates. But for this talk, I'm just gonna focus on two partly because these are what I'm working on at the moment. So these are the ones that I'm sort of at the top of my mind at the moment, but also because we've managed to simulate the results in both of these studies using the classic computational model of Gary Jones. So I thought it might be of interest in particular to this audience. Um, and so really what, how this talk is, is organized is, is like this. Um, I've already told you about the issue um, and introduced you to our sort of very toy model of what kinds of things have to be involved to explain language acquisition. And then for the rest of this talk, the majority of this talk, I'm going to now talk about um, two projects that we, that we, the two studies that we use to explore this issue. One, which is looks at the role of lexical processing speed in the individual differences in vocabulary acquisition. And another one, which looks at the role of phonological working memory capacity in um, 
the acquisition of in individual in, in explaining individual differences in children's vocabulary acquisition and then in the third study i'm going to present with to you the computational model that we have um, which looks at the role of vocabulary size in um, uh, determining processing speed and working memory capacity before drawing conclusions okay so i'm going to jump to study one Okay, so we've known for a while that faster processing of familiar words correlates with vocabulary size in children and adults. And this has led many people to suggest that there's a causal relation here, that children who can process familiar words faster as infants in particular are at an advantage in learning new words. Perhaps as the Nalden Marchman say, that faster processing of familiar words frees up resources that can then be dedicated to the learning of new words. So the argument here is that children can only process a number of words in a sentence before the memory trace fades. And if they're faster at processing, they can process more of the words in that sentence more quickly, which gives them plenty of time both to process familiar words and to process new words, novel words, and to try and link the referent of novel words to its meaning. So try and link novel words to its meaning. So the ar argument here is that the faster you can process familiar words, the more resources or the more time you have to process and learn um, what novel words mean. But most of the literature <laughs> only shows correlations between lexical processing speed and vocabulary growth. And correlations cannot show a causal effect. So one of the first things, studies that we did in Language 0 to 5 uh, was actually to see if we could replicate this relationship with our Language 0 to 5 children, but also to add a longitudinal dimension to see if children who had faster processing speeds at one age actually seemed to learn new vocabulary more quickly at subsequent developmental so to do this, we use the traditional um, looking while listening um, paradigm. And this is relatively simple as long as you have an eye tracker. If you don't have an eye tracker, it involves lots of manual coding. But with an eye tracker, it's relatively straightforward. Children sit in an eye tracker that you can see here on the left, and they watch two pictures on a screen of objects that they're familiar with, objects that they know the names of. And then they hear a voice asking them to look at one of the pictures so they can hear, uh, look at the ball or where's the doggy. And we then record how quickly children move from looking at the distractor picture to looking at the target picture on the target word, at, on hearing the target word. In other words, their reaction time to respond to the target word. And this reaction time becomes our speed of processing variable. The speed at which they process the word, say doggy, could extract its meaning and look at the picture associated with the word. So how quickly they identify what that they heard the word doggy and they identify the referent of the doggy on the screen and then look at it. That's their speed of processing measure. So this is just going to give you um, an example of uh, what one trial might look like. This is what the child sees on the screen and the little purple dot, which you'll see dotting around, um, it tells you where the child is looking as, as the child hears the sentence unfold. And I think the audio works because we tested it before we began, but shout out if it doesn't. Where's the doggy? Can you see it? So what happens here is that the child hears uh, where's the doggy. They've been we're looking at both of the screens. Uh, they hear where's the doggy when they're, they're looking at the baby, when they hear where's the doggy and they immediately move their eyes to look at the doggy. So I'll just show you that again because it's not necessarily easy to see the first time. Where's the doggy? Can you see it? So that's what a, a looking what listening a trial looks like. It's not complicated. Um, uh, and what we did is we tested the language 0 to 5 children in the lab at the University of Liverpool at three different 
ages at 18 or slash 19 months data point. So we had sort of six week data points. So we tested them 18 and 19 month data point, the 24 slash 25 month data point and the 30 slash 31 month data point. And there are 64 trials um, with the outcome variable, excuse me, being the reaction time or how quickly they move their eyes to look at the target item on hearing the label. And then what we did is we also took vocabulary measures um, using the most um, common method of testing the vocabulary of young children under three, which is to ask their parents to tick off on a checklist what words their children know and what words their children produce. And because we uh, use different checklists for different ages and because we were testing our children developmentally, we used three different CDI checklists. Um, the UK CDI for the young when they were younger, the Lincoln CDI when they were a little bit older and the CDI three when they were uh, between two and two and two and a half and three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is that right? Anyway, yeah, I think so. Um, okay. So here are the results. First, we looked to see if we could replicate the correlations between processing speed and vocabulary size that we found in the literature. And this table gives you lots and lots and lots of correlations, all corrected for multiple comparisons, I must say. Um, and what you can, so what you've got in the first um, row is the vocabulary, the age at which we took vocabulary measures. So 18 months, 19 months, 21 months, 24 months, blah, 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 blah. We took CDIs at a lot of months. We have a lot of language data for these kids. And then in the second column, you can see the correlation between vocabulary at 18 months um, and the 18 or 19 months speed of processing scores. In the third column, the correlation between the correlations between vocabulary and speed of processing measures at 24, 25 months. And in the final column, correlation between vocabulary and um, speed of processing at 30, 31 months. And I just want to point out that um, actually the only age at which we found a correlation between vocabulary and processing speed was at 18 and 19 months. So you can see here a correlation of 0.36 between 18 month vocabulary scores and 18, 19 month speed of processing scores, but even at 36 months, so sort of a year later, there's still quite a high correlation between vocabulary at 36 months and speed of processing at 18 or 19 months. So because we only sort of got the concurrent correlations at 18, 19 months, uh, these are the data that we focus on for the rest of the study. I can talk about what's going on at 24 and 25 and 30, 31 months later if you're interested. The key thing for us is that whether processing speed predicted the speed of later growth. In other words, do children who have a faster processing speed at 18 months then grow their vocabulary faster over the next six to 12 months. So that's what we tested in the next analysis. And for this, we used um, growth curve analysis. And here again, you can see the results, um, a, a, an illustration of the results, which I'll explain. Um, on the y-axis, you can see the child's expressive vocabulary size on the checklist. And uh, on the x-axis, you can see the measurement, the age at which the vocabulary checklist was done. So 19, 21, 24, 25, 27 months. Each of these gray lines is an individual child. And this tells you the trajectory of the vocabulary growth of each individual child between 19 and 30 months. But most importantly, what I've superimposed on this graph are the and the red line shows you the mean growth in the vocabulary size of the children who were fast processors at uh, 18, 19 months. So these are children who are above the median processing speed of the sample at 18, 19 months. And in blue, you can see the average vocabulary growth of the slow processes at the 18, 19 month data point. And what you can see quite clearly is that the fast processes start out with bigger vocabulary actually, um, and maintain this advantage over the next year. But actually there's no evidence that these children grow their vocabulary faster. Um, in, in our growth. So there's no evidence of an interaction between reaction time and vocabulary size in the linear term. Now, there was 
an effect on the quadratic term, which suggests that the shape of vocabulary growth is affected by processing speed. Um, so, and what it looks like from this graph is that the slow processes seem to show consistent linear growth, whereas the fast processes show a sort of different pattern where they seem to grow their vocabulary faster and then slow down, probably because of a ceiling effect in the vocabulary checklist. Um, so to sort of explore this a little bit further, we took just the data before the ceiling effect, so data up to 25 months of age. And we actually assessed whether the effect of processing speed on vocabulary growth differed according to expressive vocabulary levels at 19 months, right? So the reason we did this is that Fernald and Marchman um, showed, have reported that there were effects of processing speed on vocabulary growth in late talkers, but not in typically developing children. And so, and there are a couple of other studies have also suggested that processing speed may affect slow developers faster, more than fast developers. So we asked, does processing speed affect children with low vocabularies differently from children with high vocabularies? And the answer here was, was yes. Um, what I'm showing you in this graph here is the change in expressive vocabulary between uh, sort of 19 and 25 months of age, divided by children who were, who had, um, high vocabularies at 19 months versus though you had low vocabularies at, at, at 19 months. Um, and the blue and purple lines show the low vocabulary children. And the low vocabulary children with faster processing speeds indicated by the blue line grow their vocabulary faster than the low vocabulary children with slow processing speeds. So processing speed does seem to have a positive effect on vocabulary growth for children with lower vocabularies, which is indicated by this interaction between reaction time and vocabulary level on the linear term. Okay, so the conclusion of this study, the claim was that faster processes can, processes can learn words faster. Our result was that children who process familiar words faster do have bigger vocabularies, but the effect on vocabulary is largely driven by slower processes at 18 or 19 months of age, and there's no effect of processing speed at the later ages. So our conclusion from this study was that the effect of processing speed interacts with the child's current knowledge state. Children who are faster at processing have an advantage early in the lexicon building process. Processing speed becomes a less important constraint on new word learning later on. So with other skills, for example, such as the ability to do syntactic bootstrapping may play a more important role. In other words, to go back to our toy diagram of the uh, language acquisition process, what we have is a constraint that comes from the child's learning system processing speed, um, which affects the speed at which children can learn language, but which is also affected itself by what the children already know. So children who know a lot about language are faster at processing it, and therefore processing speed sort of, as you get older, it ceases to become so much of a constraint on the speed of new learning. Okay, so Caroline. Yes. You, hello. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Okay. Um so I was wondering, um, have you tried using AWC or CTC measures uh instead of uh the processing speed, just like for our comparison purposes? So I was wondering if you had a percent error coefficients using those two predictors. Um yes. Um I have done in form and analysis. So AWC is adult word count. For those who don't yeah. know it, it's a measure from the Lena system, which tells you how many words a child hears in a day. And CTC is conversational turn count, which is a measure from the same system, which tells you how many conversational turns a child takes um, with their caregiver. Um, I do have um, measures of those two things for the language 0 to 5 um, data. I get um, small but insignificant effects of adult word count, but 
big enough that I think they're real, just not it's not significant. And I get effects of conversational turn count on children's vocabulary. It, it's it's clearly there, although with conversational turn count, there's always a debate about the effect of causality, right? Is it that kids mm. are chatty and therefore mm. take more turns? What I haven't got is a measure of whether Oh, yes, I have actually. Um, I have a PhD student who who did an analysis where we looked at everything together and um, the effect of when you include things like adult word count, conversational turn count, but also things like gender, family history of language disorders, etc. We were trying to sort of see what might predict very slow talkers. Um, what comes out of those analyses is a speed of processing comes out as quite a a small predictor uh adult workout doesn't come out as a predictor actually which is interesting mm. um but actually what i'm going to talk about now non-word repetition actually comes out as the best predictor of language at this was at language at two apart from language at an earlier stage which is always the best predictor if you see what i mean so so the answer is i i haven't done exactly what you suggest but i think speed of processing from what we have done speed of processing is probably a slightly stronger prediction than adult word count okay whether it's a stronger prediction than child directed speech the amount of child directed speech i don't know for example okay awesome thank you okay thanks for the question i'm happy to take other questions now if anyone has another question or i can move on on study one Okay, I'm going to move on. If you do have questions, stick them in the chat, please. Or interrupt me. Thanks, Marvin. Okay, so study two is a very similar thing, but instead of using speed of processing, we're looking at phonological working memory capacity as measured by the non-word repetition task. So the idea here is that there's a long history of literature on non-word repetition performance, which sort of is traditionally, although a bit controversially, claimed to measure uh, uh, the size of phonological working memory. So um, a non-word repetition task is a very simple study. You just ask children to repeat back non-words such as palimatrenk, palimatrenk, or palimatrenk. Um, and the children's success of this task is said to reflect their working memory capacity. Um, so the idea is here, a child with a small working memory capacity won't be able to process the whole of the non-word before the memory trace fades. So it's a very similar idea to that with, with which we have speed of processing measures. Um, so a child won't be able to process the whole word and before the memory trace fades. And if they can't process the whole word, then they can't repeat the whole word. But a child with a bigger working memory capacity will. So the argument here is that uh, no word repetition performance reflects the size of phonological working memory, and we know that non-word repetition performance correlates with vocabulary size in dozens and dozens of studies. So the question here is, uh, you know, so, so so it does correlate, but the question again is that is this a causal relation? There is an assumption in the literature that this is a causal relation that a child with a large phonological working memory capacity will be able to sort of temporarily store and hence learn more from their input. And therefore children with better non-word repetition performance will learn language faster. <laughs> so once again, um, is that a question or just someone who's unmuted by, okay, someone who's unmuted by accident. Um, so the, in the second study, we also tried to replicate this relationship, but again, with a longitudinal dimension. So we're testing the prediction that non-word repetition performance will predict vocabulary growth um, in, later, in, in the later months. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so we tested children at the 24-25 month data point and the 30-31 month data point. You cannot get children to do this task younger than two. One of the problems that we faced was that existing tasks are not really suitable for very young children. So we designed a new task for uh, two-year-olds, which I can talk about later if you're interested in uh, the details. Um, but importantly, we embedded this uh, task in a fuzzy felt game 
where the child is given a sticker for each non-word she repeats to put on a board to make a nice picture. So we managed to convince our children to repeat, to do this meaningless experiment of repeating non-words. And I want to show you um, what a couple of trials look like here. Can you say lamb? Lamb. <laughs> and can you say dog? Dog. The car. <laughs> and can you say vorp? Vorp. Well done. Oh! Oh, what is it? A sheep. Clever girl. And can you, oh, is he walking along? You can go on the grass if you like. And can you say pine? So the children just did this task and um, correct performance was simply the number of non-words repeated correctly. There's different ways that you can um, code and analyze non-word repetition. Um, data, which again, we can talk about if you're interested, but we basically looked at uh, the number of non-words that were repeated correctly out of 18. So that was our non-word repetition task. Um, we took the same uh, language measures using this parental report checklist, the CDI, but for reasons that I'm going to talk about in a minute, we also um, use measures from the BPVS, the British Picture Vocabulary Scale, which is um, a standardized test for British English children, which is equivalent to the American PPVT. So here are the results. As predicted, we very easily um, uh, replicated the strong relationship in the literature or the very much replicated uh, relationship in the literature between non-word repetition performance and vocabulary size, a concurrent vocabulary size. But we were really interested in whether there was a sort of growth in vocabulary, um, a, a f interaction between non-word repetition performance and growth in vocabulary over time. Um, so uh, this is what we looked at um, um, next. What you can see uh, in this graph are um, two graphs. On the left, you see um, the relation. You see the results uh, looking at non-word repetition performance at 25 months of age. In the orange line is um, the, the average vocabulary across the next six months of children who had high non-word repetition scores. And in the blue line is the vo average vocabulary of the children who had low, uh, so below median non-word repetition scores at um, uh, 25 months of age. And on the right, the graph shows you the same thing, but instead looking at the non-word repetition scores at 31 months. Again, as with speed of processing, it was the data from the individual children that went into the analysis in a growth curve analysis. Again, children with better non-word repetition performance did have bigger vocabularies overall, but again, there was no evidence that faster processes grew their vocabulary faster. However, Again, we get this problem of the ceiling effect in the data, where because the fast kids um, are learning a lot of language, they're actually reaching ceiling on the checklist um, very early on. So to combat this, we were able to also do redo the analysis using BPVS scores, which don't have a ceiling effect. And we had these BPVS scores at 36 and 42 months. And here, when you, when you don't have a ceiling effect on the vocabulary data, what we found is that the children who had a better non-word repetition performance at 25 months, had bigger vocabularies and actually grew their vocabularies faster. So here there was some evidence that non-word repetition scores at 25 months predicted faster vocabulary growth subsequently, but non-word repetition scores at 31 months didn't. Okay, so the concluding of study two, um, the claim is that children with better non-word repetition performance, i.e. bigger working memory capacity, will learn language faster, um, our result was that two-year-olds with better scores uh, did have bigger vocabularies, and there was some evidence that they subsequently grew their vocabularies faster. 
but the effect was stronger at the 24, 25 month data point than at the 30, 31 month data point. So again, we're seeing this effect of working memory capacity on language growth, but bigger earlier in the lexicon building process. So coming back again to my toy diagram of the language acquisition process, we find similar effects with working memory or non-word repetition performance as with processing speed. There is a constraint on learning, but this constraint perhaps changes with age or more particularly with the amount of language that children already know. Okay, so I'm gonna have a quick pause in case anyone wants to ask a question on study two. Otherwise we'll move on to the computational model. Okay, we'll move on. So what I've shown is that there's some evidence that children with faster processing speeds and bigger working memory capacities learn language faster. But the key question is why? So there are clearly innate differences in how quickly children learn language. We know that there are effects of genetics on individual differences in language acquisition because from behavioral genetic studies. So there is definitely a role for innate knowledge, but I was particularly intrigued by the idea that language experience could actually speed up processing and actually may improve working memory itself. And this is what we turn to in study three. We, we turn to this idea that actually the amount of linguistic knowledge that the child has might actually speed up processing or seem to improve working memory capacity. And to think about this idea, we need to turn to the literature on memory. So many, many decades ago, before even I was born, Miller presented the idea that short-term memory could only hold about five to nine chunks of information, the very famous seven plus or minus two rule. So this is why we can't remember, but why it's really hard to remember long sequences of numbers like this one, which is actually the phone number of my childhood home. However, Miller also introduced the novel idea that actually a chunk is any meaningful unit. So if you can combine units of information into chunks, you can actually remember longer sequences of information. So for example, I can remember the phone number of my childhood home because I've chunked it into three chunks, 01483 560 724. So chunking is a process through which through learning and experience, sort of multiple individual elements are compressed and recoded into a single perceptual unit. And nowadays we know that this process of building chunked representations through association is a fundamental part of human learning and processing. And importantly, a chunk can contain digits or chess positions or people's faces or words. And when we're learning words, we're actually performing a chunking action. We're stringing together strings of phonemes or syllables that make up the word. And these um, are combined and compressed into a single perceptual unit, a chunk. And that's what happens when we learn at least the phonological representation of a word. So a child who has already learned a lot of words has actually already learned a lot of word level chunks. And therefore, this child can fit more words into working memory and seems to have a bigger working memory capacity. So if you've learned the two words, the and playground, you can represent these words as just two chunks. And therefore, you can process both words in your limited capacity working memory. If not, if you haven't learned them as words, you're trying to process a stream of sounds and you won't be able, a sort of long stream of sounds and you won't be able to necessarily fit these into working memory. So that's a sort of basic idea between chunking but actually 
uh, working memory capacity has a relationship with speed of processing as well. Because within the chunking model, it takes the same amount of time to process a chunk, no matter how big that chunk is. It takes about 400 milliseconds to process a chunk. So the bigger chunks you have, the faster you process sentences. So once you've learned the word the and playground as chunks, it only takes you 400 milliseconds to process each word, which means you can process the whole phrase in 800 milliseconds. So chunking theory actually makes predictions about the relationship between working memory, processing speed, and vocabulary acquisition. It predicts that children with more language experience will have bigger vocabularies, in other words, more and bigger chunks of linguistic information stored in long-term memory. And because they have bigger vocabularies, they will have better non-word repetition performance, i.e. will fit more information chunks in their fixed capacity working memory and they will have faster processing speeds because each chunk takes the same amount of time to process no matter how long it is. So if we apply the chunky model of memory and learning to vocabulary acquisition, these are the predictions that we make. So we set out to test these predictions using a computational model that implements a chunking learning mechanism. And this model is called Classic. It's a symbolic model, so not a connectionist model, but learning is associative and based on implicit learning of sequence information and on chunking. So the way it learns is that repeated exposure to a stimulus set leads to the stimuli being represented using larger and larger chunks. Learning is incremental and constrained to adjacent items. And the input is usually the phonemic version of child-directed utterance is usually from the child's database. So the input is real, data to kids. And importantly, uh, input is filtered through a fixed verbal working memory capacity, which we've set at 4.5 chunks. So you can process four point, on average 4.5 chunks at a time, but that can change. It just sort of speeds up and slows down learning. So how does classic learn? To illustrate this, I want to take an example of the model seeing three presentations of where's the dog. So on the left hand side, you can see the input where's the dog three times. In the middle, you can see a representation of how classic processes the input. Um, in the uh, pink and yellow squares represent uh, how classic chunks the input. So yellow squares indicates the chunks that Classic has accessed in its processing window. And pink squares represents the chunks that it can't access. And then on the right, you see what Classic learns at each stage in the, in the processing. So it processes a certain amount of information coming in, and then it learns from that information. And the way that it learns is um, it sort of chunks up adjacent sequences of information. So just to go through what happens, the classic starts off with only the knowledge of phonemes and then it hears where's the dog. It's limited to processing only four chunks of this information from where's the dog. So it passes the input as nine one phoneme chunks, only four of which are access for learning, the yellow chunks that you can see here. So it only accesses these four yellow chunks. It, those four yellow chunks can then be learnt, sort of uh, can then be um, learnt. And the way learning happens is that you're chunking up, uh, you're creating two bigger chunks by combining adjacent access chunks and storing them in the lexicon. Classic doesn't chunk phonemes across different words, which is also something uh, we can talk about. The second time it accesses where's the dog is limited again to processing four chunks, but because it's already got some chunks already that it can use to process where's the dog, it can actually access more of the input. So you can see here in the yellow chunks, it's still only accessing four chunks, but it's actually accessing more of the input because one of these chunks contains two phonemes that it's already learned. So from these four chunks, new chunks that it's learned, again, the learning happen, the learning process sort of combines um, adjacent chunks into new and bigger chunks, which here is actually two words. So at this point, classic has actually learned two words, the and dog. And then at the final stage, 
of this presentation here actually um the because it's a probabilistic processing window here actually classic can access five chunks of information and what you can see is that because it's already chunked up a lot of information it already can access the and dog as chunks it's actually able to access nearly the whole sentence here so it's able to access every single chunk every single phony apart from this one here in pink and then that allows it again those um those chunks of information are then sort of combined uh, into bigger and new and bigger chunks of information. And at this stage, actually, um, what Classic is doing is combining the two words, the and dog, into one sort of fixed phrase, um, the dog. So if these predictions are right, we should be able to simulate the relationship between vocabulary, speed of processing, and non-word repetition performance that we see in the children in the classic model. So we should be able to simulate the idea, the prediction that models or children with more language experience will have bigger vocabularies. And because they have bigger vocabularies, they should have better non-word repetition performance, faster processing speeds as well. So this is what we did. We took uh we created a training set for classic we pulled lots of child directed input data from the childish transcripts and we generated novel input samples of different sizes so our low input models had 1500 um utterances saw so 1500 utterances our high input models saw 120,000 utterances and we had lots and lots of different sort of unique input quantity levels 80 unique input quantity levels in between each input uh increasing in equal increments of 1500 utterances and then we had five separate samples generated for each quantity level which gave us 400 simulations so we have lots and lots of different simulations which simulate them, the vocabulary learning in the model at different levels of input from low levels of input to high levels of input. Our first question was, do the simulations with more language experience have bigger vocabularies? The answer is obviously yes. Um, apologies that the legend is wrong here. The amount of input on the legend and the graph on the left should range from 1500 to, uh, to whatever it was, um, 120,000. Um, but here, basically, what you can see in the graph on the left is that the um, uh, models with most input here in grey also grow their vocabulary faster. They have higher Lincoln CDI scores. And this sort of replicates the individual differences that we see in the language 0 to 5 children whose data, whose um, growth in vocabulary you can see on the right. So simulations with richer language input do learn words faster. Our second question was, uh, do the simulations that have bigger vocabularies also process these words faster? And for that, we gave the models that gave Classic the speed of processing tasks. So we presented it with sentences from the task, like where's the baby, at the equivalent of the child's 18 month data point. And I can talk about how we worked out when the model was 18 months old later, if you want. Um, and then we, we defined processing speed as the number of chunks needed to process a sentence on the basis that if you have fewer, if you need fewer chunks to process a sentence, then you have a faster processing speed. The vocabulary task is basically the CDI. We presented all the CDI words um, and defined vocabulary size as the number of words, classic processes using only one chunk. And here are the results. The question was, do the simulations that have bigger vocabularies also process familiar words faster in the speed of processing task? And the answer is yes. Um, the children, the, the models with looking while listening scores below the median, which in other words, who are faster, um, process the input in fewer chunks, had grew their vocabulary faster over um, the period of development. And, uh, and this is just to show you that the, the two curves, this is the, the models results and the results from the language 0 to 5 children, and they look very similar. 
And then our final question was, do the simulations that have bigger vocabularies also perform better on the non-word repetition tasks? We presented the non-word repetition task of the classic simulations. Successful performance was defined as classic being able to process the entire non-word. Again, gave the classic the CDI, but also the BPVS vocabulary task this time. And again, the results, the, the answer is yes, the simulations with better non-word repetition performance do have bigger vocabularies over development. At the top, you can see the results using the CDI scores. Um, at the bottom, you can see the results using the BPVS scores. And in each case, the simulations that scored higher on the non-word repetition task, uh, both at 25 and at 31 months, had bigger vocabularies and maintained those advantages. And again, just to compare the results from the simulations, just a visual illustration that the results from the simulations and the results of the children show the same trajectories, but with some interesting differences that we can talk about later if you want. So study three conclusion, why do some children have faster processing speeds and bigger working memories? It could be innate differences, but also it could be language experience related differences. Our experience based model with a simple associative chunk based learning mechanism simulates individual differences in the speed of vocabulary growth, the relationship between vocabulary size and lexical speed of processing and relationship between vocabulary and non word repetition task performance. And I just want to remind you that none of these models have been built in with different processing speeds or different processing windows. They all have a limited processing window, but every model has the same size processing window. It simulates different individual differences in vocabulary growth purely as a result of different amounts of input. Okay, so to conclude, to bring back what I started with right at the beginning of the talk, when we think about how children learn language from their input, we need to go beyond looking just at direct correlations between experience and language learning. What we've shown is that what matters is not just the language experience, but also the nature of the learning and processing mechanisms. And in particular, in this talk, I've talked about the processing constraints that affect how much information children can process in working memory and how fast they can process this information. But what is additionally interesting is that in part three, we showed that the amount of linguistic knowledge that children store in the form of chunks of information actually affect the capacity of the processing mechanisms. So we have this important feedback loop, which means that children with more linguistic knowledge might actually learn faster in a rich gets richer type scenario, which has interesting and perhaps worrying implications for children who find vocabulary learning more difficult, but also perhaps some interesting implications for the kinds of interventions that might help speed up that language acquisition for these children in the future. And that's everything I want to say. Obviously, thanks to the whole Language 0 to 5 team, especially the people who led the papers that I've talked about today, and our funders and the wonderful 95 children who took part in the Language 0 to 5 project. And thank you for listening.